Hey everyone, thank you for uh, joining us for what's going to be a looks like a rapid fire fireside chat on on crypto. Uh, so just to get started, how many people here own some cryptocurrency? Oh. Okay. All right. How many people have invested in token sales, ICOs? A few, not many. Few. And how many people here are working on a crypto project right now of some sort? Looks like a few of you. Great. So, um, you know, our topic today is mostly going to center on what's happening currently in the, in the world of raising via a token sale. And uh, because I'm assuming a lot of people here are, are, are focused on, st are on companies or are looking to start new projects. So, um, you know, both of us have a lot of experience with, uh, with investing in traditional equity and, and also via, um, via ICOs and helping companies get their token sales up and going. So just to get, kick it off, uh, Marissa, I know you've been working with a lot of companies on their token sales. Perhaps you can share a little about your experience and your background there. So I started a company called ARC about a year ago, and we advise companies that are going through the ICO process. So kind of high level strategy, fundraising, um, legal and regulatory frameworks. And we're also, we do a bunch of, um, syndicate a lot of the deals that we advise, and we're also raising a fund. So we have advised over 20 ICOs in the last year, which is a lot, and the landscape has changed quite a bit, um, which I'll tell you about. Right, and, and my background real quickly is I, I ran uh, several, um, I, I was an angel investor and I ran uh, a fund focused on uh, frontier tech, in this case AR and VR, but I was also uh, personally investing in ICOs and valuing projects and meeting with the heads of projects there. So, um, you know, have, we've kind of seen from, kind of from 2017 last year, a lot of new regulation uh, come into play, especially in the U.S. So, Marissa, perhaps you could share a little bit about, you know, how do you feel this stuff has changed since you started working on, on token sales? Yeah, I mean, so in the beginning when companies would go out and try to raise money through this, through an ICO, there was hardly any, um, nobody really hired law firms. People were raising $20 million in 24 hours. They were not doing KYC on any of the people buying tokens. So um, it was very unregulated. And then over the past year, we've seen the SEC in the U.S., as well as regulators around the world kind of jump in and make comments, um, some of them kind of indicating that they will regulate cryptocurrencies or you know, banning ICOs in the case of China. So what I haven't seen is I haven't seen it dampen the appetite for companies to raise money this way. So I think in 2017, there were close to 1,000 ICOs and they raised like $5 billion worth of capital, which is crazy, easily dwarfing venture capital. So what percentage of the deals that you've looked at do you feel have been fall into like kind of sketchy or scammy territory? Yeah. Let's, let's start with let's start with not not necessarily following the rule of law, but more yeah. like clearly yeah. out to not build a product and just raise yeah. money and maybe run away with it. So I would say that when we're looking at companies to work with, we very much approach it the same way as a venture capitalist, you would look at whether you want to invest in a company. So you're looking at the team, the product they want to build, does it make sense? Have they done this before? Um, does the yeah does the technology make sense in terms of the ecosystem and who are their competitors? So I would say that we don't get involved in those types of projects, and I think most companies that are raising money this way do intend to build product, but they're I think the biggest problem is they're raising way too much money, and they're not tying it to milestones. There's no um, self governance for the most part. Uh, uh, that's an interesting point. How do you determine the right amount of money to raise? Well, I think you know in any any startup needs to have some sort of a product roadmap and they need to, you know, just like the companies you look at, they need to have some idea of what their, their budget looks like to get to the first milestone, whatever V1 of their product is. And it really shouldn't be any different th through um, when you're raising money through a different mechanism, so. So have you ever advised companies to not raise via token sale and instead go the equity route? And what were what the criteria for that? Yeah, I, gu I guess we have told companies, you know, an ICO doesn't make sense for you um, for various reasons. I, I don't think it's also either or. Like, I think sometimes companies want to have um, a seed round of equity and have a few investors on board that are really focused on um, longevity and, you know, someone who's going to sit on their board or help them once they raise all this other capital. So I don't think it's an either or. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What, what's your view on that? Well, I mean, so when we look at companies where it's, it's all about the people, um, and what's interesting is that regardless of the fact that these companies are raising 
you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, these are still effectively seed stage companies. They're yeah. still companies that don't have a product yet, that um, don't have any traction yet, but now they're sitting on just like piles of cash. Yep. And, you know, when you're investing in frontier technologies, it's not, and unlike, you know, a normal startup that's, you know, maybe building a mobile app or a marketplace or something like that, um, you know, these, a lot of these companies are, are building on a platform that's not yet built, mm -hmm. right? So even if you're building on top of Ethereum, you're still building on something that has the reach of maybe, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people, nothing like the internet, right? So when we, when we look at, you know, these companies and, and classify them, I would put them in the category of frontier tech. Yep. Um, a company building on crypto has a slight advantage to a company building for VR, for example. Both are nascent platforms. Yeah. So you really have to focus on the people and their ability to persevere and have yeah. grit. And I think you made an interesting point also about governance. Yeah. Um, so something that you know we consider when we're investing in a company, especially at the early stage or the equity stage, is how do we, you know, how do we take them from being, you know, two or three people that have an idea and a prototype to having a business or a path to where they're ready for venture for actual like a yeah. Series A venture round where, you know, dollars allow them to scale the business. And I haven't really seen that yet in crypto. Yeah. Um, you know, if you think about actual consumer applications of crypto outside of store of value, CryptoKitties is probably the closest yeah. thing to an actual mass market consumer application. And they're seeing tens of thousands of daily active users, which is, you know, small by any, you know, by yeah. any measure. So, from our perspective, this is this is truly early stage investing, yeah. and you have to focus on the team first. And like you said, right sizing the round is a big part of that as well. Yeah, and there's also really cool things that you can do in terms of smart contracts, in terms of locking. Like if you're contributing to a project in Bitcoin, you can actually lock it and make the company hit certain milestones or you know tie governance into the smart contract, which I haven't seen companies do, but I feel like it's going to be required hopefully in the next year or so. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's like, um, you know, when, when you raise an equity round or you start a company, you're forced to vest your stock, yeah. right? But for a long while, founders didn't have to vest their, their tokens that they were yeah. raising. And additionally, investors, they would put money in before an ICO, get a yeah. discount, not be locked up. And then as soon as the, as soon as the, the tokens become publicly tradable, yeah. they would go and sell them, yeah. right? So it's as if you invested in a company pre-IPO and then immediately dumped all your shares day one as soon as it started trading, which would be obviously awful for any public market investor who, yeah. who you know, got in after you. So like the governance is obviously evolving. Um, perhaps we could sh switch gears a little bit and talk about the regulatory environment. I mean, if you're gonna decide, if you do decide to go down the token sale route, yeah. how do you not end up in jail? <laughs> Well, I think um, the biggest thing is get the right advisors and, and hire law firms. I mean, these are very novel um, legal issues that even the experts disagree on. So you can go to a bunch of different law firms and they will all tell you a slightly different interpretation of the law. So it's not something you should be trying to interpret yourself. Um, tax advisors, the Deloitte is charging like a half million dollars to structure an ICO right now. So it's a lot of money. The, uh, basically, the funding mechanism to me is a hybrid between angel and IPO, which is crazy because there's a lot in between, but it has some factors that are very similar to going through the ICO process. And part of that is tax advice, structuring, really solid legal advice. Um, you have to be also, it's an it's a international crowd sale for the most part. So you have to worry about all the different jurisdictions you're raising money in and get legal advice in all those jurisdictions, which is a lot. <laughs> so so um, if you're a founder and you're your team, you have a project and idea, and you don't have half a million dollars to go yeah. and spend on legal advice yeah. and, um, and accounting advice, how, what's the path to actually getting out there with, uh, you know, with, with advisors that are gonna help you? I mean, we really like to tell companies to raise your first seed round of a million dollars in order to go through the ICO process because everything costs money. Hiring advisors, um, road shows, pitching at conferences. Unfortunately, in crypto, it's, a lot of it is pay for play. So all the people who are pitching at conferences, a lot of them have paid a pretty big sponsorship, sh sponsorship fee to be there. So We did not pay to be here. <laughs> So, yeah, go, go raise money first. And if you can't raise money as, as a seed round, maybe you shouldn't be raising money from 
the general public. That's great. And, and so, um, are there any projects that, or, or is there anything that you know you you haven't seen yet that you think would be would make a really great uh, ICO candidate or token sale candidate that's not yet you know come across yeah. your desk? Um, so I think we're still very much in the um, infrastructure, build, infrastructure building phase. So if you think about an analogy to Web 1.0, like building browsers and you know the consumer kind of plays, I feel like it's way too early. You can tell me if I'm wrong about that. But I think wallets, exchanges, um, I'm seeing a lot of platforms for um, building and launching security tokens because I think that's going to be a huge in the next year. Um, did, did Dave Sachs, the ex... Uh, one of the ex-executives at PayPal is actually yep. working on that, right? Yes. That's, uh, that's There's a, a couple har of them. That's Harbor. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that we're still in that phase. I mean, for the most part, it's still really hard to buy crypto and hold crypto. And most of the people who are even doing it are not doing it in the right way. And there's still a lot of issues with security. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for companies to address the security issue. And maybe they, are, they do an ICO or they don't. But it's still valuable to the ecosystem. Uh, the idea of security tokens is getting a lot of steam, at least in Silicon Valley, and a lot of people believe that that's actually going to be the next wave yeah. of ICOs. Um, are you seeing any of those start to pop up yet? Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, security tokens are um, tokens that are backed by assets, revenues, equity, basically any type of asset um, where you can kind of share in that return. And, and, they're, and they're registered, just to be clear. They're also yeah. registered. They're either any, registered yeah. or they're under an exemption. Um, with the SEC or whatever the regulatory body is. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to kind of bring uh, previously illiquid assets and make them more liquid. So even all the LP interests that people have in, in venture funds and private equity funds, you can tokenize all of those, trade them, tokenize real estate, fractionalize it, trade them. I think there's going to be a huge explosion of that, um, those types of projects. So the idea with security tokens is you don't want to be the first lemming off the cliff, right? Because the first person to figure out how to actually do one of these things is probably going to incur a lot of cost. So when do you think the first security token is going to become available and, and start trading? Well, and where is it going to trade? It's, I mean, question. it's so um, there's T0 is one of the um, big exchanges where you'll be able to trade security tokens. And they're not live yet, but they will be. Um, there's going to be a couple others that pop up in the next six months. So there will be places to trade. Um, and there are actually a lot of projects that are already doing security tokens. So there's a uh, project called 22X, which is actually um, a bunch of founders from 500 startups the incubator got together, contributed 10% of their equity, tokenized it. So it's basically an LP in, an, in a venture fund, but it's represented by a token. And the smart contract, you get dividends if there's an exit. And I think it's just a really cool new model of, of early stage tech investing. Oh, that's awesome. I, yeah. I haven't heard of so that. So I'm sure Y Combinator will be doing this and all these other... Uh, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, post-ICO, post-token sale, how are people, you know, if some of these companies have raised, you know, 20, 30, 40, 100 million dollars yeah. uh, in Ethereum or Bitcoin yeah. or whatever, how are they, like, what are they doing with those funds? Like, where are they living? Good are question. They, yeah. Like, how are they, custo <laughs> like, how are they securing it? Like, like, like do, you, do you help them with that as well? Yeah, so I mean, there's a few things going on. One is that a lot of these companies a year ago raised um, most of their funds in Bitcoin and Ethereum when the price was much, much lower. So when they were initially sitting on $20 million, they're now sitting on $100 million or whatever it is. And so they're basically a fund now. So instead of being a company, they're, they have to worry about um, actively trading or investing these assets. And so they... Most of the ones I know are having a little bit of trouble finding the motivation to, to build their product with, you know, sitting on that much money. And there's also the kind of custodian issue. There aren't, there now are a few custodians that will um, custody crypto assets, but there, that wasn't true six months ago. So even just worrying about security and how to store your crypto. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, Everyone's, you know, the, the the whole promise of crypto is to be your own bank, but it turns out it's yeah. extremely stressful to be <laughs> your own bank. Yeah, it is. Um, so, uh, just, you know, w w just to give you some color here, to everyone here, some color. Um, you know, we've actually gone through. Uh, I, I run a company called Rarebits. It's a digital exchange for for crypto goods. Um, 
I do believe that the consumer stuff is a bit early right now, yeah. but I, I think there's an opportunity to potentially build in the future. Um, but we spent a lot of time going through the NICO process and eventually decided to pull the plug on it because we just determined it was too risky. Yeah. Um, additionally, and, and this is something that, that, that I found interesting, is that most of the experts in the field, of people who actually know what's going on, it seems like they're really backed up. There's, you know, for, uh, you know, for our lawyers, we use Perkins Coe, which is considered one of the top, top tier firms in the space. You know, they're backed up months. And so, uh, you know, have you been seeing that across the board? It doesn't make sense for people to go with the big names or can they use smaller firms? And, um, you know, how's, how's your workload? Have you, are you seeing the same thing on your um, end? Yeah, I mean, I can't take any new companies and especially now that we're investing as well. So we have to analyze deals on that. From that perspective, um, I'm just, I have zero time to do anything, but I totally agree that all the people who kind of know what's going on have no bandwidth. And it's, I, I do think it's, you know, it's, it's okay to go with smaller players, but if they don't have the experience under their belt, it's not gonna be useful, so. So, so, so what would your advice be to, comp to a smaller company now? Maybe you've gone and raised your first million dollars of equity, yeah. and you're like, I, I wanna go spend this cash yeah. to go out and do a token sale and, and, and raise yeah. you know, 20 million plus. And uh, I mean, uh, the other question I have is, is that, what's the minimum do you think that someone should raise um, to do a token sale? But do, yeah. it's a two-parter. Yeah. Minimum amount you should raise, and then what should you do in order to actually get there given this problem? I think given the, the effort and the cost of capital, raising under 10 million doesn't make sense. So 10 million plus, um, there's a real, real hurdle once you get to kind of beyond 30 million, it gets a lot harder to raise capital because you kind of sat, you know, the market's very saturated as it is and you kind of tap into all the different investor communities and then at that point you really have to go deeper or wider or, you know, do something to raise the, the rest. Um, but I think there's a huge sense of like urgency and FOMO and I think it's better for companies to take their time and realize like, yes, there are regulations that shift, you know, basically on a daily basis. So you're going to have to, you know, adjust your playbook as you go. But I think this feeling of like, if we don't do it in two months, like we can never do it. That's a bad approach. That's just when you end up going out and having to push your sale date back and a lot of things that are, that don't look very good. So it, it doesn't make sense to time to market at all. Obviously, crypto is down significantly. Yep. Yep. Does it make sense to time to market? Um, wait, sorry, what was your question? It doesn't make sense to time the market, to try oh. to time the market. Yeah, I mean, okay, so there's two things. I think it's, it's hard for me to tell whether it's better for crypto to be up or down because when it's up, there's a huge opportunity cost to, you know, taking your Bitcoin and buying another type of token. Um, there's also the whole issue of realizing capital gains. So I'm not actually sure. I mean, I think people who are in the space who are sitting, who are kind of the crypto nouveau riche, who are in the last year or so have, are sitting on huge piles of crypto, those people need to diversify anyway, so it's kind of always a good time to raise money from them. Great, thank you. Uh, so we're out of time, but we'll be at the, uh, the, the cafe later for Q&A if you have specific questions for us. Thanks again.